All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, I'm Jay Wiederholt, the local uh, Passive House, Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, president. Um, I just want to do a quick introduction first uh, before our speaker, Gary Nelson, begins. Um, we've done a few webinars, and this is our third one this fall, and we hope to repeat that in the spring. So uh, that's part of why we had the, uh, the fee and uh, so that we can continue to educate here and on the web. Um, a little history real quick about what we're doing. Um, locally and nationally, we have a Passive House Alliance that has started, and this is a group to uh, support the Passive House Institute here in the United mm -hmm. States. There are similar groups uh, in other countries. Um, you can think of it as sim uh, along the lines of the AIA nationally, and this is just a local chapter. There are many other local chapters around the country. Um, our mission and our program is mainly, you know, to do these types of things to educate and to bring people together and to spread the word. Um, right now, uh, our national organization has really uh, made a big inroads in 2012, and we are up to over 300, uh, coming up on 350 members nationwide. Uh, and here's just a few of our chapters uh, across the country. Um, and so if any of you guys have friends in other towns that want to start up their own chapter or get interested, uh, please feel free to contact Mark Miller at our national office. Um, real quick, I just wanted to recognize some of the people that have been volunteers here locally and in the crowd. Uh, in the back, we have Suzanne Carpenter, who's our treasurer. Uh, Philip Gross, also sitting in the back. Uh, Tim Ian, who's been uh, instrumental in the Twin Cities uh, for a long time in this uh, passive house market. Uh, Jennifer Books um, is here, um, and I guess myself, and I don't know, I don't think I'm leaving anybody out. Um, and I guess this was a past slide uh, showing that the movement has caught the ear of some of the big uh, individuals in residential sustainable design across the country. Uh, Joe Seabrook and Amory Lovins at the past uh, passive house conference really uh, seem to be on board with what we're doing and the Building Science Corporation is now in a direct partnership with Passive House Institute United States. Um, and just last week here in Minneapolis, we had our AIA convention and throughout the entire week, there was a lot of talk about uh, energy performance and looking past lead and to get to that next step. And we're trying we're, to chirp up and say, hey, we're already here. We're gonna try to promote this and get it out there to the masses. So if you guys, Anybody online or in the crowd today, um, you know, if you're talking to your friends a little bit about building envelope and some of the problems that you see, uh, feel free to use this as a resource and to reach out and we'd be happy to come and talk to you about uh, Passive House uh, to your office um, or just to pick up the phone. Right now, I just want to do, you know, how many people in the audience are familiar with Passive House and kind of how it works? All right, great, that's the majority. So I think I can skip the last part, Tim. So great, um, without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our speaker today, Gary Nelson, who is uh, a longtime expert on blower doors and air tightness and many other probably facets of sustainability that I, I, I would do disservice uh, trying to describe. So thank you, Gary. Thanks, Jay. Switch forward if you just want to. Okay, and I need to know, is there a way, will the, uh, you can uh, just hit that will exit. stay there? I want that. Okay. I want to use that as a pointer, and usually on a, on a PC, I have to do something so that that doesn't shut itself off. Is that the case here, or will that just stay on? No, that should stay on every time you touch it. It might go off, and when you touch it, it'll come back on. Okay, there is a way to make it just stay, but that's fine. Uh, and I've never used one of these, so let's see. Where's page down? Just the arrow to the left. Like that. Ah, okay. So, good afternoon. Uh, I think this is the first talk I've ever given where I've been drinking beer during the talk, and, and I think this is a really good idea. <laughs> And you should have no problem getting more speakers to uh, come and address this uh, group. Uh, so I did send some objectives out. 
and I'll just briefly go through those. Uh, we're, I think kind of woven in, be, in, in the talk, we'll talk a little bit about the importance of air tightness in high performance buildings. Uh, I think everybody's already aware of, uh, you know, uh, air leakage is typically a third of the energy use of typical buildings uh, or houses, I should say, in, in the U.S. Uh, uh, air leaking out of houses causes ice dams, uh, condensation in walls, mold growth. Air leaking in in warm, humid weather also causes condensation and mold growth. Uh, uh, it causes comfort issues, uh, and there's some health and safety concerns. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I am really a geek. Uh, everybody knows that, that you know, I'm, I'm a physicist and an engineer by training, and I'm hoping that there are some people out there in the audience that are interested in the little technical <laughs> details, because if you're not, you're going to get bored, I, I'm afraid. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, and I'm also assuming, and I should ask the people in the room at least, how many people here have seen a blower door test? Okay, so half or so at least know what a blower door is. Of the rest of you that haven't seen one, how many of you at least know kind of what a blower door test is? All right, everybody at least has uh, some idea. I want to go a little bit through some basics of airflow and pressure in buildings and, and talk about what does a blower door really measure? Uh, uh, a lot of people think it measures things that it doesn't. Uh, and and uh, an issue these days is how do we state the air tightness of, of a building? And it's really confusing, as we'll find out. There are a whole bunch of different metrics that are used uh, to state how airtight houses are. And unfortunately, well, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm particularly here to talk uh, a lot about passive houses. I've been somewhat involved with the passive house uh, group in, in the US. I've been to all but one of the conferences. Uh, uh, I was on the founding board of EBA, which is the Energy Efficient Building Association, or it used to be, uh, that really got started back around 1981. Uh, for the same reason, to promote really, really energy efficient buildings. And uh, the, the super insulated houses of the 80s were really very, very similar to the passive houses of today, although we now have better windows and we know more about air sealing and so on. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm focusing somewhat on, the, on passive houses, and uh, I think it's important to to understand the, the, the various metrics that are used uh, because I think we're using some of the wrong metrics. And I'm gonna suggest that at least on bigger buildings, we, we change the metrics that we're using. And I, I think most people that are geeks like me agree and, and it'll probably happen, but I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about estimating natural air change rates in buildings. Uh, and then uh, I'll go through some of the requirements for doing a blower door test on a passive house, uh, both in the US and in other countries. Um, oh, my pictures don't show up. Is that right? Or, oh, there, okay, there they are. Uh, um, so this is just a simple diagram of a house. Uh, we have a, where is it? Okay. This is the blower door fan. So imagine that this house is sitting here on a day. There's no temperature difference between inside and outside. There's no wind. So with the blower door off, there's no pressure difference between inside and outside. And then we turn the blower door on and depressurize the house. We can either pressurize or depressurize. Uh, so we turn the blower door on and create a slight negative pressure in the building. And then every place where there's a leak, whether the leak is from the attic through a duct leak into the, into the duct work and then back into the house through the supply and return registers or the interior duct leaks, or the air is coming from a crawl space vent, uh, finding a duct leak and getting sucked in through the return ducts. Uh, uh, when we depressurize the house, 
all of the leaks in the house are leaking in. The only place air is going out is through the blower door fan. And because of conservation of mass, the airflow rate going out through the blower door fan has to equal the airflow rate coming in through the leaks. So we're measuring at a certain pressure, at whatever pressure we're causing with the blower door fan running, we're measuring the leakage of the building with the blower door. The, the, and th this picture shows uh, a minus 50. Uh, I should have probably said something about Pascals. Uh, we're gonna, we all in, in the air tightness uh, community talk about pressures in Pascals. It's a metric unit of pressure. Uh, 50 pascals is really close to about one pound per square foot of pressure. Uh, 50 pascals is about the pressure on your forehead when, they're, when you're facing into a 20 mile an hour wind. And when we're doing this test, we have a 20 mile an hour wind blowing on all four sides of the house, the top and the bottom, all at the same time. So this is far from uh, natural conditions. In, in, uh, in natural conditions, air is leaking in through half the leaks or so, and it's leaking out through the other half. And the flow in through the leaks where it's leaking in is always equal to the flow out through the leaks where it's leaking out. Uh, but you have no way of knowing which leaks are leaking in and which are leaking out in, under, under normal operation. But when we're doing the blower door test, if we're depressurizing by, by 50 pascals, uh, we know that all the leaks are leaking in and the total airflow is equal to the air going out through the blower door. Um, so mass flow through the fan is equal to the mass flow through the leaks. Uh, now, if we, if we do the test on a day when it's 70 degrees out and we're at sea level, we, we are measuring airflow under what our container can, considered standard conditions. Uh, but if it's zero degrees outside and it's 70 degrees inside, um, the flow coming in in cubic feet per minute is actually smaller than the flow in cubic feet per minute that are going out because the air expands as it comes in. And there are various standards we'll talk about briefly later that uh, uh, try to, that, that have in them uh, calculation procedures to adjust so that what we would try to measure with, with the blower door is how much would the house leak if we were testing the house under standard conditions. So there are corrections for altitude and uh, outdoor and indoor temperature differences that get made we're not going to get into that level of detail. That's always uh, uh, done with computer programs that are used to, to do all the analysis, but uh, that's all I'm going to say about that for now. Um, and one of the most common measures of the air tightness of a building or the leakage of the building is at when we induce a pressure of 50 pascals, how much air does it take? How much air are we sucking out, which is equal to the air that's being drawn in? Uh, how much is that flow at uh, 50 pascals of pressure difference uh, in CFM? And most of the weatherization programs in the country, this is the measure they use. They, their, their target is usually to get houses down to 1,000 or 1,500 CFM uh, at 50 pascals. And uh, often that's all, all the calculations they do. They don't adjust for the size of the building or, or anything. It's just a simple absolute uh, uh, measure of the air tightness of a house. I, I should have mentioned, feel free to ask questions at any time as we're, as we're going along. Yes? Why is each commercial Why is what? Oh, yeah, the... I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yes, the question is, why do we use 75 pascals for commercial buildings? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think it's because, and actually in most European countries, I think in all European countries and probably most countries in the world, 
they also test big buildings at 50 pascals. I think in the U.S. we probably test at 75 because of a lot of the default pressures that you test building components at, like commercial windows and doors and wall assemblies and so on, for some reason a long time ago, a long time in this industry being 20 years maybe, uh, for some reason they started talk, testing at 75. And I think some people have been in favor of testing buildings at the same pressure that they test components so that you can kind of compare things. Uh, in this talk, even when we're talking about commercial buildings, I'm going to translate all the numbers into leakage at 50 pascals, uh, just so that we only have one new thing to think about here instead of a whole bunch of things. Uh, so I guess, uh, OK, I should go back here. So when we turn the blower door on, it turns out well, we, we can imagine if there's a stack effect in the in the building, uh, if it's cold out and warm inside, there's actually, before we turn the blower door on, there's a positive pressure at the top of the house and, there's a, and then there's a negative pressure at the bottom of the house. When we turn the blower door on, the pressures aren't going to be the same everywhere. Ideally, we want to test, we want to come up with how much do all of the leaks leak when we apply a 50 pascal pressure? Well... We can't get a 50 pascal pressure on all the leaks all at the same time, all of the time. Sometimes we can, but but not usually. Um, so one important idea is this thing called Pascal's Principle. Uh, Blaise Pascal was a French, uh, they didn't call him physicists or mathematicians back then. He was a uh, natural scientist, I believe, in France. And he discovered that in a container full of fluid, if you change the pressure at one spot in the container, the pressure everywhere can will change by exactly the same amount. So a corollary of, of his principle is that when we turn a blower door on, as long as the building is one open space, one zone, when we turn a blower door on, the pressure changes everywhere by exactly 50 pascals. So, and I think, I think, uh, oh, and I haven't talked, baseline pressure. By baseline pressure here, what we mean is, what is the pressure in the building before we turn the blower door on with the blower door sealed off at some position, some point in the, in the building where we're going to measure the pressure difference between inside and outside. Um, for years, there was the requirement that we actually measure the change in pressure at the bottom and at the top so that we could average the two to get the actual change in pressure. But the people that wrote that standard hadn't realized that Pascal in 1650 had figured out that the pressure changes the same everywhere. So as long as we subtract off what the pressure was before we started, it doesn't really matter where we measure the pressure because the pressure will change the same everywhere in the building. Uh, this is, I'm not going to talk about the stack effect. Presumably everybody here knows something about the, the stack effect. But this was just to, to illustrate that on a cold day, uh, we have a negative pressure at the bottom. We have a positive pressure at the top. So if I put a blower door fan in this, in this building, if I were to measure at the neutral pressure plane where there's no pressure, I'd be starting out at zero. I turn the blower door on and I go until the pressure gets to be 50. But if I measure the pressure down at the bottom and it's starting out at minus 2.7, I just turn the blower door on and I go until the pressure is minus 52.7. And at that point, I know that the pressure at the neutral pressure point is 50, and the pressure at the top is 50 minus 2.7, 47.3. And it isn't the same everywhere, but the average is approximately 50 because before we turn the blower door off, large areas of the building, well, roughly half of the building is leaking in, 
roughly half of the building is leaking out. So on the average, you could say the pressure is about zero. It's positive half in half of the building. It's negative in half. The average is about zero. So we could measure at the neutral pressure plane, but because of Nat Pascal's principle, we, it, it doesn't really matter where we measure. And it turns out when it's windy out, wind is really the devil for doing Blordor tests. Wind causes noise. Pressures are fluctuating all over. And the wind isn't, doesn't blow very hard down at the ground. And it turns out that the pressure fluctuations are way less at the bottom of the building. So usually we would like to measure the pressure at the, the pressure difference between inside and outside of the building at the bottom where the wind is the lowest and on the leeward side of the building where it's uh, more still air outside. And then wherever we started from, we just depressurized by 50 pascals in order to get the flow at 50 pascals. Now it does turn out these leaks, airflow, I think that's actually coming up. I'll uh, do that here. So characterizing the air leakage. So the way usually a blower door test is done, this we, we test the house at several different pressures, typically starting from 10 or 15 pascals and going up to 60 or 70 or 80, depending on is it a commercial building or a house. And then at each one of those pressures, we measure the flow and this y-axis should be labeled CFM. Uh, and it would be nice if this was a straight line. It would make lots of our calculations all much simpler. Life would be great, but it's not. It, it turns out it's got a shape kind of like this. Uh, and people have found experimentally that if you fit an equation to the multipoint data that a power law like this, where the flow is a constant times the pressure difference that we're inducing with the fan raised to a power n. Now for leaks like if, if you have a window open or you've got a piece of cardboard with a round hole in it, it turns out the flow will be will be almost exactly proportional to the square root of the pressure difference. And that just means in this equation, n is 0.5. A power law with an exponent of 0.5 is the same as the square root. Uh, it also turns out if you have uh, really skinny long leaks, or if you say have densely packed cellulose insulation in a wall and there's air flowing through the wall, through the cellulose insulation, you get what's called laminar flow. And under laminar flow, this, this exponent n becomes one. Um, and in all other cases, the exponent n should be somewhere between 0.5 and one. Theor theory says it should be between 0.5 and one if everything else, if everything is uh, going right. I think we won't talk about that. Uh, and I already mentioned air density and viscosity also affect the, the uh, leakage curve. And uh, we're going to come back to this, that, that even though you see this power law equation written everywhere, the real curve isn't a power law. The, the physics tell us that it's not really a power law. It just turns out that when you fit the data over a fairly narrow range, it fits a power law pretty well. So if you have a true power law and you graph the data on log-log paper, this is where these distances are proportional to the logarithm of the number instead of the number itself, it turns out that a a true power law when plotted on log log paper turns into a perfectly straight line. And the slope of that line is related to that exponent. And theoretically, if you measure that exponent and you find out that it's something close to 0.5, that theoretically tells you that you're going to tend to have 
larger, shorter leaks. If the exponent is point close to one, you're going to have tiny long leaks instead of uh, big short leaks. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, if, if we do a Blorador test, can the technician, you know, look at the results and tell us, are we looking for big leaks or small leaks? And yeah, in theory, sort of. But it turns out that a lot of times you may think you're looking for small leaks because, say, at a, a partition wall in the middle of the building, you've got a whole bunch of tiny leaks where air can leak from the building into the partition wall. And that leak has an exponent of one. But all that air that leaks into the partition wall leaks out at the top plate that's missing. And up in the attic, what you really are looking for is that big missing top plate. That's where you're going to seal. And so you could make a mistake and just look for tiny leaks in that case, because the tiny leaks where the air is leaking into that partition wall do have a high exponent, but what you're really looking for is the hole where the where all those things come together and leak out the top of the building, which is a big hole. So I wouldn't really believe these numbers too much, but sometimes it's a it's a little bit useful to look at the exponent and especially if it's close to either 0.5 or one, which is rare. Usually it turns out that that exponent n is somewhere between about 0.55 and 0.75, and it doesn't really vary by a whole lot. Um, there hasn't been, it, it, it's actually hard to measure a building over a large range of pressures and to go down to really low pressures. And I, I should have mentioned that under natural uh, conditions when air when a house is or a building is just leaking from natural air infiltration pressures due to wind and stack effect uh, unless it's pretty cold out or pretty windy out most of the leakage is down here between one and ten pascals or so so ideally it would be nice if we could measure the air tightness of a building down there but because of wind and uh, and other things going on, it's actually really hard to measure down at low pressures. So this, this is some, some of the only data that I've seen published where somebody did very careful measurements down, way down to one Pascal. And, and it's really clear that uh, it's not exactly a straight line. And it also turns out if you really wanna know how leaky a building is down here at one or two Pascals, Testing up here and then extrapolating with a straight line gives you the wrong answer. And uh, oh, that, that's enough of that. Um, so back when I started in the late 70s, early 80s, we actually would get a piece of log log paper and we would graph the data and we'd take a ruler and we'd draw a, a line through the data but I just thought I'd show this just so that you can see some of the things that we can see from this graph when we do a multi-point blower dart test. And I suppose I shouldn't look that way because then they won't be able to hear, right? I, I can look here. I, I now believe that you can see it. Um, so here we've tested a, a building from 60 or so pascals down to 15, draw a straight line and one thing we can get is, is, you know, if these data points, if it was a windy day, the data wouldn't be all exactly on a straight line. And we can use this to kind of average a bunch of points together and uh, uh, get better data than when it would if we just tested at a single pressure. So we can pick off of this line at 50 pascals 
what the flow is. And we can read that. And of course, a computer can do it a lot better than we can. So this shows you, you know, one of the things we're going to get off of a Blardor test is the airflow at 50 pascals. Um, we can also, a common number to, that, that is used in uh, 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 analyzing Blardor data is how much it leaks at 10 pascals. And in this case, it is 800 CFM something like 880 CFM. And it turns out that an orifice, uh, if you have a flat, thin plate of, ma of material and you cut a sharp edged hole in it, that the area of that hole you can get from the flow at 10 pascals multiplied by 0.2939, I think it is. So anyway, this is just illustrating that from this data, from these data, and from this graph where we extrapolate down to 10 pascals, we can calculate, and this is often done, we calculate a equivalent leakage area. It's the size of a hole of a particular geometry that would leak exactly the same amount of, as the house does at a particular pressure. And so there's this thing called the equivalent leakage area and it's often abbreviated ELA. And for this house, it's 254 square inches. Yeah, 259 square inches. Uh, another thing that's frequently done is because in the, this equivalent leakage area was actually defined by some Canadians where it's cold out a lot of the time and they have 10 pascals of pressure acting on their houses. So they decided to calculate that it would be uh, useful to know the hole size at roughly 10 pascals of pressure. A bunch of Cali some California researchers, though, decided at the same time, independently, that, uh, oh, houses leak at about 4 pascals. And they defined a leakage area that instead of a sharp-edged hole in a thin piece of material was now kind of a nozzle-shaped, rounded hole in a not a thin material, but a thick material. And so they calculated from this shape of hole what how many how what the area would be uh, that that hole would leak at four pascals. And they called that the effective leakage area, not the equivalent leakage area, but guess what? The abbreviation is ELA. And to this day, you read papers all the time that says the ELA was measured at blah, blah, blah. And you don't know which ELA it was. And you can see this is an actual test. The EQLA is 254 square inches. The ELA is 132. So you don't know much better than within a factor of two what the real leakage of the building is uh, when you, when you uh, read that the ELA is a certain, a certain level. So already we've got CFM 50, we've got ELA, and we've got EQLA. Bo all of those are kind of absolute air tightness measurements that don't take into account anything about the size of the house. But we'd really like to compare houses. Is, is house A tighter than house B? Well, I guess you could say no matter how big they are, if the CFM 50 is higher, then it's leakier. But we want some kind of quality measurement. Um, so, okay, so there are all these different units that we use, CFM at 50 pascals, liters per second at 50 pascals, ELA at 4 pascals, EQLA at 10 pascals, but now we want to normalize by something that's related to the size of the building. And uh, one really commonly used uh, uh, metric these days in commercial buildings is how much does the building leak at 75 pascals in CFM per square foot of surface area of the building. <clears throat> now it's interesting in England, they usually don't include the slab on the, on the ground. They just use the surface area of the four walls and the roof. But in the rest of the world, they use all six sides. Now, fortunately, the Brits are deciding, 
all right, we're going to go along with everybody because we really do want to all uh, be able to talk together and compare our buildings among ourselves. And, and so I think now it's getting to be, th this is getting to be a very common standard. Of course, in Europe, it's not CFM, it's cubic meters per hour per square meter instead of CFM per square foot. And of course, cubic meters per hour isn't a metric unit because hours is, you know, the metric unit of time is seconds. So it should be really cubic meters per second. But that's a real small number, so they don't like that. And the question. Is the, 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 the flat aerial here the Yeah, and in fact, back back when we started first making blower doors, we came up with something called the Minneapolis leakage ratio, which was CFM 50 divided by the above ground surface area. And it turns out that's exactly what the Brits do. They, they only would count the, the walls above ground <clears throat> and then the roof or the ceiling of the top floor. But yeah, you could do that. Um, and then another, and this I think came first, uh, was to normalize by volume. So we came up with this idea of air changes per hour at 50 pascals. Instead of how many cubic feet go through the building per hour or per minute, we calculate how many air, how many house volumes of air go through the building when it's pressurized to 50 pascals. Uh, and I, I kind of think this started in either Sweden or Canada. Uh, the, both the Swedes and the Canadians were the first ones to do a lot of this kind of work. So it's, it's, this probably came from them. Uh, but you can see air changes per hour at 50 pascals. And this is the passive house program. The, the standard for houses is that they have to be less than 0.6 air changes per hour when tested at a pressure of 50 pascals. Uh, and in order to calculate this, you just take the CFM and multiply by 60. That gives you CFH, cubic feet per hour. And if you divide the cubic feet per hour by the volume of the building, you find out how many air changes there are each hour. And, uh, and then a, another commonly used metric is uh, you take the leakage area and you divide it by the floor area. And that's called the specific leakage area. That's used in Canada a lot, or in uh, California a lot. In all of the California regulations, they, they use specific leakage area. And, well, I wish we would just all decide to use one or two different metrics instead of, you know, there's, there's dozens of these that are used. <coughs> But now I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about two different metrics that are used and talk about uh, is it better to, does it make more sense to normalize a building by its volume or by the surface area? And I'm just going to work two simple examples and we're going to do the calculation both ways. So here we have a, a house that's 50 by 40 by 8. Volume is 16,000 cubic feet. The surface area, all six sides, are 5,400 square feet. And we're going to say that this just meets the passive house requirement of 0.6 air changes per hour. And later we're going to talk about, well, what's volume? But we'll come back to that. For now, volume is simple, right? It's, it's just the inside volume from sheetrock to sheetrock for the length, from sheetrock to sheetrock for the width, and from the finished floor to the finished ceiling for the height, just the interior volume of the building. Uh, so if the house just meets the passive house requirement, then we can calculate that CFM 50 is 160 CFM. That means those of you that don't know about passive houses uh, should realize these houses are really tight. A common size of a dryer is 160 CFM. CFM or a, a range hood, that's kind of a small range hoods. You can get range hoods that are a thousand CFM. If you turn on a thousand CFM range hood in this house, you're going to suck the windows in. Uh, if you turn on a, a, a normal dryer, you're going to depressurize the house by 50 pascals. 
uh, the dryer will still move about the same air. So you'll just find that if you have doors that open out, it's going to get to be hard to open the door when the dryer is running. And you, you really notice that. Uh, these are noticeable pressures. So I just want to point out th this, this uh, 0.6 ACH50 is really tight compared to what we're used to. Uh, and then I'm going to calculate the CFM50 per square foot which in this case is 0.029, and let's just remember about 0.03 CFM50 per square foot. And now what does that mean? Well, that means on the average, every square foot of this building leaks if you pressurize, if you have 50 pascals of pressure difference across it, it leaks about 0.03 CFM. Now, one thing, one thing I like about CFM 50 per square foot is uh, buildings leak through their surface. They don't leak through the volume. The air in the middle of the house isn't anywhere close to an exterior surface. It does, just doesn't magically somehow leak out of the building. It takes a leaky surface to leak. And this this metric, CFM 50 per square foot, is a measure of the permeability of the exterior surfaces of the building, which I like. It has a physical meaning to it. Uh, you could get a piece of plywood and you could test and see how many CFM per square foot is it, and then you could add it up times the number of pieces of plywood in a house, and you'd know roughly how much of the leakage of a house that has plywood in the walls and nothing else. Uh, you'd get an idea how much it would leak. Um, so now what happens, we're going we're gonna to make this, the shape of the house stays exactly the same, but we're going to make all the dimensions twice as big. So it's now 100 by 80 by 16. The volume goes up by a factor of 8. The surface area goes up by a factor of 4. When we do the calculations, the CFM50 goes up by a factor of 8 because it, it's still 0.6 ACH50. This building still just meets the passive house standard. And because the volume increased by eight times, the allowable leakage increased by eight times. But the CFM 50 per square foot only doubled. Actually, this didn't go up eight times. Yeah, yeah, the leakage did. Uh, so this means these two buildings both just meet the passive house requirement. Every square foot of this bigger building leaks twice as much as it does in the smaller building. And I don't think that makes any sense at all. It's actually easier to make a big building have surfaces that leak less because there are more of them. They're bigger surfaces. Where buildings really leak are the edges. It's where the walls and the, and the ceiling meet. It's where the walls and the floor meet. It's the corners. It's the bump outs. And those aren't really proportional to the size of the building. There's kind of a certain number of edges. And well, the bigger it is, the longer those edges are. But, but uh, uh, anyway, it seems, it seems to me to make a lot more sense to use this number and, and to not allow bigger buildings to have leakier surfaces in them. Uh, and now if we made this building two or, or four or 16 times bigger and we get to be in real big buildings, like a million square feet or a half a million square foot buildings, it turns out if you meet the passive house requirement, you've got a leaky sieve of a building. You'd have a very uncomfortable, you'd have a failed building. So I think, and, and I think, you know, you, using air changes per hour at 50 pascals, um, when we're comparing small, smaller, you know, single family houses is fine. But when we start using this standard, the passive house standard for bigger buildings, which we're doing, I mean, in, in Europe, they're building apartment buildings and office buildings that are passive house buildings. And to me, it makes, and, and I think the Germans that I know at least all agree that it makes no sense to use this 0.6 uh, air changes per hour any, any longer. We should be using uh, something that's related to the, 
to the leakage of the surfaces. So I think CFM 50 per square foot or, or something like that makes a lot more sense. Uh, I forgot that I should keep track of time. And how, how long do I have? Well, it's until seven. But that we were until probably seven. having. Okay, hour. there's pl plenty of time, plenty of time, plenty of time. Okay. So next I want to go over Fios's testing requirements for doing a blower door test on a house. Um, uh, and these are different slightly from the German Passive House Institute requirements. Uh, and I, I think it turns out the Passive House Institute doesn't really, doesn't really care if other countries have slightly different standards for things. They just want to see good houses <laughs> built. And, and we'll talk about that. Actually, there's a Swedish Passive House standard that, that is quite different from the rest of Europe. But um, so these are the requirements in the U.S. if you're going to certify a house through the Passive House Institute U.S. And I'm sure there are people here that know more about this than I do. So if I screw up, let me know. So with a FIAS house, the well, and this is true in, the, in Europe also. The final test has to be done on the finished building. It's a good idea to probably do a test when the air barrier is installed and you're, you can still see at least some of it so that when you do a test and you fail, it's not too late to fix it. Uh, going out to a house that's all done, the sheetrock, everything is in, the paint is on the wall and it doesn't pass and the leaks are hidden inside the walls is, I don't like to do that. Uh, uh, it's it's a good idea to do a preliminary test sometime uh, and make sure that you're going to pass. Uh, but I think all of the, the it, it makes sense to have the program say that it has to be tested at the end because you can do a preliminary test and then the electrician and the plumber come and your house is just full of holes again and it wouldn't wouldn't pass the final test. Uh, uh, with FIAS, the test has to be done by a certified FIAS Plus rater. This FIAS Plus rater is usually somebody that has been, who is certified to be a HERS rater through ResNet, or in California, a, uh, forgot the name of the program. It used to be Cheers. It's, anyway, there's a California program that rates puts energy ratings on, on houses. Uh, so FIAS plus raters might be a California home energy rater that has gone to typically a two day class put on by FIAS that stresses all of the things that, that have to be done in addition to a regular HERS rating on a house. And the air tightness test is one of those things. There are other things like making sure that the air to air, the, the, the that the ventilation system is uh, balanced and that the heating system is installed properly and so on. Um, so the official, and I mentioned this earlier, volume. You would think volume is a simple concept, right? Well, the the Germans are, they, they're never simple. Uh, <laughs> they came up with something called the net enclosed volume. And it's a good thing that this has to be provided by the project team. Hopefully the architect has all of the drawings in software so they can push a button and they can get the, the net enclosed volume. Uh, and here I mentioned the marble thought experiment. This is something that uh, I've heard from Katrin Klingenberg. Uh, she said you can get an idea what the net enclosed volume is by before all of the kitchen cabinets are in and with all the interior doors of the house open, you drill a little hole at the very top of the building and you pour marbles in and you jiggle the building until the house is completely full of marbles. Then you let those marbles out and you measure the volume of the marbles. So. Basically what it is, is the volume that I described on the simple box minus the volume of internal partition walls 
and uh, floor and ceiling cavities or any chase, any enclosed chaseways, you know, that enclose chimneys or, or anything like that. Th those are not included in the net enclosed volume of the building. Uh, you can go around room by room and measure the internal volume of each room and then add them all up. Uh, this in many houses takes 10 times longer than doing the whole rest of the house combined, the rest of the test combined. This is the hardest thing about doing a passive house air tightness <laughs> test is, is calculating the volume. And you know, I don't think it's worth it, but, but that's the way it is. Uh, you have to both pressurize and depressurize the building. And there is automated software. My company, the Energy Conservatory, makes a program called TechTite. Our main competitor, RetroTech, also makes uh, software that essentially automate the test, which makes it harder to screw up. Uh, it warns you when something isn't quite right and uh, tells you when it's time to change range and so on. Um, so you have to do both a pressurization test and a depressurization test, and then you calculate the average of those two, and that's what has to be less than 0.6 ACH50. Uh, the software has to do the calculations according to two, two US standards. There's a ResNet standard and an ASTM standard for how to adjust for temperatures and barometric pressures and, and other things. Uh, and exactly how do you do this, the, the mathematical fit of the data of a straight line to the data, that's all specified in these standards. And the building has to be prepared according to section 802.2 .2 of this ResNet standard. And I'm, I'm gonna go through that in uh, just a little bit. That's an, an, another, uh, some, sometimes time consuming part of a test is to seal the parts of the building that we don't necessarily want to count against the leakage of the building. Like if you have an air to air heat exchanger in a building and it's designed to run 24 seven, it would kind of be a waste of money to put motorized dampers or even gravity dampers on the intake and the exhaust of that air to air heat exchanger. But it's not a leak because when it's running, it's forcing air in and out through those holes. They're not leaks. Now, if the air to air heat exchanger cycled off and on, it ran for half an hour and then it was off for half an hour. Now half of the time the thing's off and during the time that it's off, yeah, it's probably matters that it's a leak because now unconditioned air can come in and conditioned air can go out. So uh, we probably wouldn't seal, we, we would not want to seal that off. We would want to count that because it is a leak. But typically an air to air heat exchanger that's running continuously, we don't want to count as a leak because it's not. So the standard requires that some things be sealed and some things not be sealed. And this standard spells that out. Um, the Passive House Institute in Germany uh, has slightly different requirements for doing the test. You don't have to, there is no certified blower door tester, as far as I know, uh, that's required to test a passive house. Uh, it's usually the uh, uh, design professional that's in, in charge of designing the house that probably signs off or you know, has to witness the test and say that the test was done right. Uh, uh, and there's a European standard, EN 13829, that specifies exactly how to do the calculations, how to adjust for temperatures and humidities and barometric pressures and so on. Uh, instead of in the US, we use these American standards. Uh, and then the Passive House Institute specifies that you prepare the house according to this EN standard. And that EN standard has two different methods. One is where you're, they call it, I think the building envelope test for the building envelope test, which is method B, 
you have to seal off all mechanical openings. Um, in the US standard, you're only allowed to seal off a mechanical opening if it's a ventilation system that runs 24 seven. Method A is designed for what's called occupied buildings. And for occupied buildings, let's say you had a uh, natural draft water heater in a house, that's a hole. That natural draft water heater also in Minnesota would be required to have a combustion air inlet for it to supply the combustion air. According to method A and according to the ResNet standard, you are not allowed to seal those. You get penalized. If you're dumb enough to put a natural draft appliance in a passive house, you have to pay. Uh, and in fact, there's almost no way you would ever pass uh, 0.6 ACH if, if you had a natural draft appliance. And 100% of the time, if you ran the dryer, the flue gases would all be in the house. So you'd have some problems. Uh, so there is one difference though. In, in this method A, if your ventilation system happens to be one that doesn't run continuously, it cycles off and on, you still are allowed to seal it, or you're, you're required to seal it for doing the test. But in the US, you would not be. That, those openings would have to have uh, motorized dampers uh, or some kind of damper so that they wouldn't leak a lot uh, when the appliance is off. <clears throat> and I, I think that's about it. In, in most passive houses, these two standards are going to give you within a couple of percent the same, the same answer. They're, they're very similar. The, the calculation procedures were all copied by from somebody way back in the 70s or 80s that, that worked on this stuff, uh, either a Canadian standards writer or an ASTM standards writer. I don't know exactly who. Um, yeah, I guess. So why are we doing the test? Uh, well, one, oh, and did I show? No, I didn't show this. This is coming up. Um, one reason is sometimes we want to use some kind of an infiltration model to predict what's the natural infiltration rate of a building. For passive houses, there, there's the, the design software is PHPP, Passive House Planning Program. And in, the, in that program, you can put in a air tightness level that's tighter than 0.6 air changes per hour, and it will give you some credit. Well, in order to give you credit, it needs to do some calculation of what's the natural infiltration rate due to the air leakage in the building. And so there's some, some mathematical model that's used to estimate how much uh, energy is going to be lost due to the air leakage in the building. Now, ideally, if you wanted to calculate this really accurately, it would be nice to measure at lower pressures, but you only get answers that are accurate at low pressures if you, if you do a test when there's no wind or not much uh, temperature difference. So uh, in, in passive houses, there's so little infiltration to begin with that if we overestimate or underestimate by 20 or 30% the remaining infiltration, it, it's not a big deal. But the PHPP program does do that. It, it does estimate natural infiltration. Uh, of course, with the Passive House program, we're usually doing a blower door test to prove that it complies with the standard. Was, was the house built tight enough? Does it pass? And it's usually a pass-fail. Uh, and if you're going to have... A, a specification on the air tightness of a house that's that you have to pass it would be really nice if that were a repeatable sort of a test like if two day two people came out on two different days in two different weather conditions with two different manufacturers of blower doors you'd really like them to get the same answer and it's a lot easier to do that if you test at higher pressures rather than lower pressures which is i think kind of why we test at either 50 or 75 pascals because they're pretty high pressures. They're not so high that we start blowing windows out, but 
but they're high enough so that wind isn't as much of an issue. Uh, we'll probably get to a section here where we'll talk a little bit about finding leaks. Uh, a blower door is real handy to pressurize or depressurize a building to then help you find where the leaks are. Uh, and I said also to evaluate retrofit uh, effectiveness. <clears throat> so estimating natural infiltration, lots and lots of people think that you measure the infiltration rate of a building with a blower door. A blower door only really tells you the, the total equivalent size of all of the leaks in the building all added together, or the total amount that the building leaks at 50 pascals of pressure. The blower door test doesn't give you, well, walking around and feeling where the leaks are using an infrared camera or something, you can get some feeling for the location of the leaks, but uh, but the actual numbers that you get out of a blower door test don't tell you where the leaks are. Uh, and infiltration depends not only on the number that we get out of the blower door, it also depends on where the leaks are and it depends on the weather. So uh, let's see. So uh, the blower door only measures one part, and then we need some kind of mathematical, physical, usually it's a computer model, to use that combined with some, uh, some estimates of how the leaks are spread around the building and uh, and what the pressures are gonna be on the building due to the wind and the temperature difference between inside and outside of the building. So you really need models to estimate infiltration uh, in addition to the, the one input that you get from the blower door, which is just the overall air tightness. <clears throat> My voice is going. Um, a reasonably good estimate of the natural infiltration rate is found if you just take CFM 50 and divide it by 20. Uh, uh, researchers in, in, at Princeton University back in the 80s uh, did a, a bunch of tracer gas measurements and blower door test measurements on, on some houses, and they found that uh, on the average, uh, CFM 50 divided by 20 gives you a reasonable estimate. I'm guessing that PHPP does some, some kind of rough calculation like that. Uh, and then this... This is just a number I thought, oh, I should probably say something about this. Um, so how much, how much energy do we save if we reduce the CFM 50 of a house by one CFM? Uh, and it turns out in Minnesota, if you do the calculations using this CFM 50 divided by 20, you find that one CFM at 50 pascals results as in about two kilowatt hours of electric resistance heat per year. Uh, but that's only if the air leaking in comes straight in. And that, so that's, that's kind of a worst case deal. Um, so if we, if we go back to that, that first house, that 2,000 square foot 50 by 40 house, uh, it was leaking about 160 CFM at 50 pascals. So that's like 320 kilowatt hours a year at 10 cents. That's $32 worth of infiltration. Um, so is it cost effective to make to take a house that's 0.6 and make it 0.3 instead? For, you, you'll save $16 a year. So over 20 years, you might save $320 uh, if you can seal it from 0.6 to 0.3 for something like that. Yeah, it probably makes sense, but I think usually we're down at the in the diminishing returns area here. It's uh, starting to get pretty ha pretty hard to make houses lots tighter than 0.6. Uh, but if you want to think about that, well, PHPP of course helps you figure that out too. You can put put these numbers into PHPP and it'll tell you what your uh, annual load will be due to the change in or the change in load 
will be due to the fact that you changed the estimate of the air tightness of the of the building. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I quite an, understand the question, but it has to do with the the Canadians. Yeah, the Canadians and the in the Californians came up with these equivalent holes because, and and they picked the pressure that they would measure the area of those holes at based on what typical pressures might be on buildings, but. You can't just pick a single pressure because the pressures vary from zero up to hundreds of pascals in very windy weather. And how you integrate that over a whole year is is more complicated than just saying, well, although I, I guess we could say uh, we could find what what pressure would cause a ones or a, an what pressure would cause the ELA to leak the same amount as this number is? And then we could say we could have an equivalent pressure and an equivalent uh, leakage area that combined would give you about the right natural infiltration rate, maybe? No, it's not 2.5. We're taking CFM 50 and dividing by 20. So that's... But we're getting CFM, CFM out of it. So really we're dividing 50 by 20. No, but it's not, it's not linear. It's a power law. So it's going to turn out different than that. And sorry, I'm not repeating the question because I don't still quite answer it. And we need to talk more later. I need to move on. Uh, 30 minutes. Okay, that's fine. So here's the best data that I have seen anywhere where somebody did very careful blower door tests and then uh, based on the windshielding of the houses, they use, there's, a, there's an infiltration model called the LBL infiltration model that depending on your assumptions of where the holes are, how exposed the house is to the wind, and then weather data for that site will estimate the natural infiltration rate. So they went out to something like 40 houses or 50 houses, and they estimated the air change rate, which is along the, oh, no. This is the estimated air change rate according using the LBL infiltration model and using measured weather data at the site with their estimates of how the leaks were distributed and, and so on. And then they did tracer gas measurements. So they actually measured the infiltration rate over the same period that they had the weather data for that they used to calculate the infiltration rate. So each, I'll pick one of these dots. That dot right there was a house where the measured air change rate was 0.8 air changes per hour, and the predicted air change rate was 0.6 air changes per hour. If you look at all these dots, you see, you know, the models don't work that great. There's, there's a definite correlation. Leakier houses had more infiltration, but... I wouldn't rely on uh, predict the predicted infiltration rate of a of a house too much, uh, and it's not because of the the measurement of the blower door. The blower door, quite precisely, probably with an with an accuracy of better than five percent, 
measures the leakage at a certain pressure. The problem is we don't know where the leaks are and we don't know how exposed to the wind they are and we don't know what all the pressures are due to the wind at that site. And it's, it's the infiltration model that's the problem, not, not the blower door test results in my opinion, as somebody that makes Floridors, of course. But the, the modelers might d disagree with me there. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, now I, wa I want to talk about what are some of the codes and standards that are out there. Uh, and this is just a, a, an historical example. Uh, this is. This is from a Swedish publication. And these numbers here in air changes per hour at 50 pascals are the Swedish standard for air tightness in buildings in 1975. Actually, it's the 75 code that was adopted in 1977. So Sweden has had requirements of three air changes per hour at 50 pascals for all new houses, single family houses, two if they're two story houses, and one if it's a, a bigger building, a multifamily building. That's almost passive house standard, the one is. And this is uh, 87, 97, oh, 35 years ago. And I'll go on to the next one to show that the United States now has our, our international conservation code for the northern two thirds of the country. Now for the first time has a requirement for air tightness of houses of three air changes per hour. So we're only, we're, thir we're, we're 35 years behind the Swedes, but, but we're getting there. And uh, this is, a, I think, a really big deal that for the first time in the US, we, we now have a code. Of course, our international energy code, why it's called international, I don't know. We're gonna take over the world or something. Yeah. Uh, uh, our international code finally is saying houses have to, there, there is an air tightness uh, standard for new houses and they have to be tested. Of course, in the International Energy Code uh, has to be adopted by individual states. It's not automatically, uh, it doesn't automatically go into effect like the German building code or the English building code or the UK building code or whatever. It has to be adopted by states. And I've heard rumors that Minnesota is pretty close. We will, we will probably, the, the builders are kind of mostly going along, they think, a lot of, something like half the builders think that this is a good idea. And the other half mostly don't care. They'll live with this. So I, I think in the, in Minnesota, at least, we will have air tightness requirements sometime in the next year or two. Uh, it's going to take a while to adopt and, and so on. And in the rest of the, in the Southern states, you know, the very Southern tier, uh, the, the standard is relaxed some and it's five ACH 50. I don't think that makes much sense. I think in, especially in Louisiana and, and uh, you know, along the Gulf Coast and in Florida, the moisture issues and the air conditioning moisture stuff is, is just as important. It's just as important there to build tight houses as it is here, I think. Um, there obviously are some places like San Diego, it probably doesn't matter a lot. They should, they should have a different standard maybe, but, but uh, so I was going to go back to the Swedish house, the Swedish uh, standards. Notice also that in 1988, the Swedish standard was changed to be not in air changes per hour at 50 pascals any longer, but a it's like a CFM per square foot at 50 pascals that I was talking about earlier, which is, I think, the way we really need to be moving, especially if we're going to apply this to... Uh, a very large range of, of buildings. Uh, and for reference, I, I calculated this three cubic meters per square meter per, cu three cubic meters per hour per square meter is about 
0.16 CFM 50 per square foot. That passive house that was 2,000 feet was 0.03. The passive house that was much bigger was 0.06. So this is like five times leakier than a passive house. And three air changes per hour is five times leakier than a 0.6 uh, air change per hour passive house. So I think I think these standards at least applied to single family houses uh, are roughly five times leakier than, than passive houses. There's a question. So anything more about this? This I think is a real good thing, although uh, there are some problems with this being adopted by the code. The code just says all new houses shall be three ACH at 50 pascals. It doesn't say what standard. It doesn't say who does the test. It doesn't say how to calculate the volume. It doesn't say that you need, actually, I think it does say that you need ventilation. But we can still put in natural draft water heaters and dryers and kitchen fans in houses that are three ACH 50. And this is going to be a disaster. We are going to have... Minnesota isn't going to have this problem because Minnesota's had in the code this uh, protection against depressurization. You can't, you couldn't build this house and, and put in a 150 CFM kitchen fan and a 150 CFM dryer and still put in a natural draft water heater. But you can in North Dakota and South Dakota and Iowa and Wisconsin and all the rest of those states uh, that this is going to apply to. And I, I think we're going to have some problems. We need some training for people. Uh, hopefully it will be adopted fairly slowly and we'll have time. Uh, so passive house is uh, the standard is 0. 0.6 ACH 50, uh, except in Sweden where it's a flow per square area uh, like I like to see. And it's about 0. 0.06 CFM 50 per square foot. So it turns out that 2,000 square foot house, that if it meets passive house standards, this number would be required to be less than about 0.03. So in Sweden, that house would be allowed to be twice as leaky as a passive house would in Germany or in the United States. But if it were twice as big, it would be about the same number. And if it were four times as big, it would be much tighter per square foot. So it's kind of a kind of a trade-off. I think I think this is a reasonable number. I was talking to Semmel Hack today. There's a Passive House uh, Alliance technical committee that's looking into this that, that I think I'm going to be involved with. And uh, one of our jobs is going to be pick a number. <laughs> and, I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion, but I, why not go with Sweden? Um, the UK has had a requirement for commercial buildings. I think it's buildings larger than 10,000 square meter floor area. And their standard is, we won't, I'll just talk about the translation, about 0.55 CFM 50 per square foot, which is 20 times leakier than the passive house standard for houses in US or most of Europe. So I, I don't know, know how they pass how they uh, <laughs> selected this number. But of course, once you have a standard and you re require testing, uh, people figure out, well, you can't just slap the thing together. You got to pay some attention. And all of a sudden buildings get to be two or three or four times tighter than the standard. So, you know, UK buildings are not this leaky. Yeah. All these uh, numbers per square foot are the square foot in the surface area, not the foot. Surface area, all six sides of the box, including the earth contact surfaces. Yeah. And then they, they also have a best practices for air conditioning build conditioned buildings and, and that's down at point one one, which isn't isn't too bad. And I think they have other other recommendations for a, a refrigerated warehouse and all different types of buildings, some of which they recommend be extremely 
healthcare type. Um, anybody here involved with Energy Star houses? That there's a new version of Energy Star that just started in 2012. They also require in well, I think we're in Zone Seven, so I think we're. Are we in six? Okay, so. <laughs> So for Energy Star, we have to be four ACH 50. Most new houses in Minnesota are somewhere in the two to four range. Three is probably average. So we're, we're already on the average meeting the new IECC energy code, which probably is why the Minnesota builders didn't fight it too, too hard because they, they already know how to do this. It's, it's not really hard. This is a huge deal. The Army Corps of Engineers for several years now, I think it's been about three years, has required all new Army buildings to pass a standard, to meet a standard, and they have to be tested. And that test is, the, the standard is 0.25 CFM per square foot at 75 pascals. The, at 50 pascals, that turns out to be 0.19. And, uh, I know the guy that's in charge of this program and the first building that builders built after the standard went into effect, um, probably half of those builders failed their first test. Almost nobody failed their second test. It, once you realize how easy it is to build buildings, and realize, boy, it costs a lot of money to fix a building uh, compared to what it costs to build it right the first time. Uh, so they've all figured out how to do this and uh, they've now tested hundreds and hundreds of buildings and they're typically coming in at about 0.1 CFM per square foot. And that um, that's down here at 0.06 or so. That's roughly the passive house standard for that large building in Sweden, twice the passive house standard for houses in the US, but that's getting down there. That's, that's, that would be a good number. Now, uh, Terry Brennan is, is a good friend of mine, building physics guy, uh, who's tested a lot of these buildings. And he thinks that I, I think that he thinks that we've talked about this and, and he thinks that, yeah, for a barracks or an office building or something, this is pretty easy to meet. But if it, but if it's a, a, a kitchen, if it's a mess hall or a hospital with all kinds of mechanical penetrations, it's really hard to get down to 0.1 CFM per square foot at 75. So he thinks there should, there should be allowances for types of buildings, uh, that some types of buildings, especially ones with fume hoods, you know, laboratory buildings, should probably be allowed to be a little bit leakier. Um, so I'll say a little bit about testing big buildings. Yeah, easily. Um, so currently, for the US Army Air Corps of Engineers, um, you are allowed to seal mechanical openings. And of course, everybody wants to do that because it makes their building look tighter and it's easier to pass. So they seal all the mechanical openings. On a big building, it can be really time consuming to seal all of the air intakes and all of the air exhausts. Uh, and I, I've been involved with an ASHRAE study where we're going out and measuring the air tightness of some of a bunch of new commercial buildings that are four stories and greater. One of the buildings we tested was the new library at UMD and all of their air intakes were about 40 feet off the ground on the exterior walls of the building. One of them, there was an access where we could get into the ducts and we could seal that on the inside. The other one, there was no access. So we ended up sealing it down in the basement at the air handler. We had to crawl in the air handler and seal some dampers in the air handler. And there's hundreds and hundreds of feet of duct between that and where the air actually comes in. And so all those duct leaks we were measuring as part of our test, it's a mess to do the preparation for, for some of these buildings. It's, it's really a lot of work. Um, oh, we'll come back to that. Um, 
So that's that's really most of the work. The hardest part, probably, I'd say in the buildings that I've tested, probably 80% of the time spent is preparing the building for the test. Where when you do a passive house, it's, that's hardly any of the time. Uh, uh, we have, and our competitors also have software that will simultaneously control uh, a whole bunch of fans and measure the flow through those fans instantaneously, simultaneously. Uh, we've tested, the, the leakiest building we tested was uh, a building where we needed 25 blower door fans, 24 blower door fans. And it was the leakiest building that we tested in our study so far, and it was a lead platinum building. And it had the highest leakage in CFM per square feet. Uh, it was infested with Chinese beetles. Uh, uh, the people working in the building said it was the most uncomfortable building they'd ever uh, worked in. Most of them had electric heaters under their desks that ran summer and winter. Uh, was it, There wasn't one inch of weather stripping on any of the like 40 doors to the outside. Of course, that's not the main place buildings leak, but but it gives you a clue. <laughs> the, the, the designers really didn't have a clue on this building. So uh, if, I mean, it, it seems to me that if, if there are mechanical dampers in a building, uh, and those dampers are ever closed during the normal operation of the building. Usually unoccupied hours, the ventilation system is off, the dampers close. Well, during those unoccupied hours, aren't those dampers leaks? We really, I think, should test the building, close the dampers, test the building, and it gets rid of all of the preparation of the building. Maybe we have a standard that says, okay, dampers are allowed to leak this much, Walls and, you know, the six sides of the building are allowed to leak this much. Add them together, get a number, test the building. Does it pass or fail? It would reduce the time that it takes to test these buildings by, I think, 80%. Uh, and I, th I think that once the results of this study are out there and, and people see how much those dampers leak and how important damper leakage is, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll change the way we uh, test the buildings. Uh, another interesting thing we've, we've found in the ASHRAE buildings is that it, I think there were three or four buildings that had commercial kitchens in them. Uh, a couple of them were university buildings. The commercial kitchen was, was used for uh, uh, events, special events. They maybe got used once or twice a week. We were told when we saw the the three foot diameter pipe go from the first floor all the way through the sixth floor roof and was open, wide open, no damper, no nothing. We were told that that was code. To, it, had, it was not allowed to have a damper. But I've, th there was a, an article in the ASHRAE Journal uh, a couple of months ago that, that recommended that you always have dampers on kitchen commercial kitchen fans because otherwise birds get in there and it's not good to have dead birds in your kitchen ventilation system <laughs> or, or live ones either. Uh, so I don't know. I think we need we need to do something about commercial kitchen fans. They really need to be dampered somehow. It could even be a manual thing that you you know you turn the hood off and you pull a shade over the hood down in the in the kitchen or something, but. Um, they're, they're a big problem. Uh, so we set up blower doors like this. We put three fans in a door and we often have six fans in one, one opening. And, uh, and we then run, uh, long cables back to a central location. And there's a, a computer that can, can tell you what the flow is through each fan and can separately control them in banks of three or six, typically. Uh, so we can we can we could have a say a a building that was kind of two zones, uh, two big areas, but that were separated with a door that uh, didn't allow you to get uniform pressure in the two sides of the building, unless you put one bank of of blower doors in one part of the building, another bank in the other part of the building, 
and then you're, with your computer, you can control the two banks until you get both parts of the building at exactly the same pressure, and it, it makes it do the, doing these kinds of tests way, way easier. Um, in the UK, there are a bunch of these going all over. Of course, I told you how leaky their buildings are. They really need these big fans to test their, to test their big their big buildings. This one has a power takeoff from the Land Rover's gasoline engine to drive. I think it was a, like a 150,000 CFM fan. Uh, Infotech out in Virginia makes a, this is a gasoline powered, 20, has a 25 horsepower gasoline motor that's uh, inside of here that's running a fan that's probably six feet in diameter and moves about 55,000 CFM. <laughs> This is really a, a good way to test a big open warehouse kind of building. But uh, when you're testing an office building, I think if you put this on one door, you often have a problem that you don't get uniform pressures in the building because there are restrictions. We call them bottlenecks, you know, hallways and, 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 and doors, interior doors that prohibit you from getting uniform pressures. And it's, it's nice to have smaller fans and to distribute them around the building and then you can, you can uh, quite easily uh, get the whole building up to the same pressure. So here, here's a passive house in Germany, tested with one blower door fan. There, I don't know if you can see it, but there's, yeah. there's actually two of them here. But one of them is, is blowing air out and the other one is blowing air in. And they did that so that they could separately do so that they could quickly go back and forth between a pressurization test and a depressurization test without having to turn the fan around. So it's actually only one fan to test this whole building. And I think the leakage of this building per square foot turns out to be about 0.03 CFM 50 per square foot. So if we build buildings that meet the passive house standard, it becomes trivial to test them, uh, it's, it's very quick. Uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, and I think we probably would have had standards. ASHRAE would have had a standard. Uh, LEED probably would have had a standard for air tightness, except everybody said we can't test big buildings. Well, we can, we can test big buildings. And if they're tight, it's really easy to test big buildings. Uh, and I, I think I think we're going to be doing this uh, a lot more in the in the near future. And that's a good place to stop. If there are some questions or discussion or I'm going to check the online here to see if the, I'm sure there's some questions on here. That we I'm going to get a beer. Answer. All right. <laughs> Is there Um, I'm currently not seeing any questions from, well, let me see here. Well, I don't, I don't know if I see any, um, if there is any questions, I guess you can type them in now and then the audience, if you have any further questions for Gary. You must have done a really good job. I must have, or, or, or it's <laughs> too, way too geeky. Yeah. Sure. All right. I can, yeah, I can say a little bit about that. Well, the question was, uh, advice on how to make uh, a good airtight building, residential building. Um, back in the early days, back in the 70s and 80s, when this uh, term super insulation first came to be and we were building super insulated houses, in Minnesota at least, almost always the air barrier was a sheet of six mil poly or, or cross laminated. There were different kind, kinds of poly but it was always installed on the inside of the building because of course the vapor barrier has to go on the inside or you're gonna get condensation on your sheathing or whatever. Um, 
And the problem with that is you've got partition walls and floors between floors and ceilings between floors where you now have to seal the poly to the to the floor of the second floor and somehow you got to seal the first floor up to the ceiling and getting the, getting the continuity around these connections with the interior partitions was really is is hard now there are still people out there doing that and making houses that are one and a half or two ACH 50. I, I don't think anybody is using that technique to get a house as tight as the passive house standard. Yeah. Oh, you, okay. Okay. It, it can be done. Yeah. And, and it's not a bad idea, but it, it's, 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 it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. It takes a lot. There's a lot of labor involved. Um, I think a much easier approach is to, to wrap the building on the outside and then put enough foam on the outside of that so that you don't get condensation on, on the air barrier. Um, I think most, am I, am I right in Europe? I think most passive houses have multiple layers and at some point the building is wrapped on the outside and then either another stud wall is added on the outside and cellulose blown in. Uh, or foam. I don't think foam is used as much there as it is here. Uh, uh, people don't like that environmentally, and I, I don't know about that. Uh, yeah. So, so he said that usually in, in Europe, you see a load bearing wall built and the air barrier then goes on the inside of that load bearing wall. And this is what I saw when I was there maybe eight years ago or so in a two story building, um, the load bearing wall was built without, without the floor between the first and second floor installed. So you go in this building and it's OSB or plywood from the ground all the way up to the top of the building. You're in a plywood box with no connections to partitions or anything. That's made airtight. And then you build your finished walls as a second wall inside of that with the floor trusses hung from some kind of hangers on that uh, plywood or OSB probably into the studs also for, for structure. But yeah, I, I, th I think somehow eliminating having to, to seal all of those connections be around the partition walls and the, the, the uh, structural floors really makes it a lot easier. And of course, there's uh, an another thing that people try, of course, is spray foam. Well, and there's a bunch, there are people out there that think, oh, you can just build a double wall and just pack it tight full of cellulose and cellulose stops airflow. Well, cellulose slows down airflow, but I think you're going to be, it's going to be really hard to, to meet the passive house standard just doing something like that. You're, you're going to need an air barrier uh, film of some sort somewhere. Uh, so I, I don't think that's a good, good way to do it. Uh, spray foam um, is often touted as being a way of doing this, but, but the spray foam, you, you build your uh, uh, structural wall, you put the exterior sheathing on, and then you spray foam between the studs. But one of the, some of the biggest leaks, the, the bottom plate to subfloor doesn't get sealed. The crack between the subfloor and the rim joist doesn't get sealed. The rim joist to sill plate doesn't get sealed. Uh, in the corners, you miss a lot. And I've, I've, I've tested houses that were spray foamed from the inside that were not particularly airtight at all. Now, that isn't to say that it can't be done, but it, uh, if you're going to use spray foam, you need to think about what you're doing in order to really get it tight. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So here you have the spray foam depending upon the seal, and now your wood is shrinking and moving on you. Yep. And you got these 
gaps. Yeah. And it's painful and when you look at it under a magnifying glass, it comes out like little marbles. Yeah. When you put a bunch of marbles in a jar, you realize that it's pretty porous. <clears throat> and that's what's so painful and really doesn't hold the air in it. You can see it as it slows it down. Yep. Yep. Now, if you build the wall and then you spray continuous foam on the outside and then you hang a, a, your exterior siding off of some kind of hangers, there, there's a lot of commercial construction that's done that way. And, and you can obviously get a house, a building really tight that way. I know John Straub, one of uh, Joe Stebrick's partners and a building physics uh, instructor in Canada, uh, he did that to his existing house. He, he devised some kind of interesting hangers to hang an exterior second wall on the outside of his, his house. And then he sprayed foam in between those on the outside up to those hangers. And, and he got his house extremely tight. And of course, now you have no thermal bridges and uh, perfect insulation. And, and you get rid of the chance of moisture problems because you've got enough insulation outside of the condensing plane where you're not going to get condensation in the wall. And there's a lot to be said by for putting foam on the outside of a wall that, that air can't get to, that it has to stop before it starts. You don't want air to be leaking out through all the cracks in the foam either, but uh, some, you need some kind of a barrier. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, a lot of buildings these days will, will have a couple layers of foam and either the inside layer will be taped or the outside layer will be taped. And you can really get houses extremely tight by taping things. And I, I really wonder, you know, in 50 years, uh, is that tape still gonna be good? Supposedly, uh, you know, people are doing accelerated aging tests and. Probably if you use tapes that were designed by the same and sold by the same manufacturer that that made the thing that you're taping to, maybe you have a chance. But, you know, when you get a tape from one manufacturer and a, a, a weather resistive barrier from another manufacturer and then you try to tape everything together, uh, I don't know if that's going to hold up or not. I don't think anybody does. Prime, yeah, and there are primers, and and there are some. I, I've heard good things lately about uh, Tremco having really good literature that describes what of all of the things that they make, what can be used with, what products can be used with other products without having interactions. I think we really need more manufacturers giving us that kind of information about, you know, what products go together. When can you rely on adhesives to stick to things? And how do you have to prepare those surfaces if you need primers or, or whatever? The trends seem to be towards more acrylic type adhesives versus beetles. Or asphalt based adhesives, so they don't have the marble texture showing them like they would need for steel. Yep. So he's, he's saying the type of adhesive obviously matters and it should be flexible. And if it's seeing, of course, if you have foam on the outside, the, the, hopefully the, it won't see the, the temperature swings. That's a nice thing about getting an insulated wall, whether it's a double wall sprayed with, or uh, packed with cellulose or foam or whatever, getting that on the outside of your air barrier is going to make your air barrier a lot probably a lot more durable. It's not going to see the temperature swings and the moisture swings that it'll see if it's on the outside. Yeah. So the question is, have I seen Tyvek being used successfully? Oh yeah, Tyvek certainly can be, can be sealed. You hardly ever see it that way. Unless you look at the manufacturer's instructions, they show you how to do it, but nobody does it that way. So I, you know, I sure see a lot of Tyvek just flapping in the wind. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think something like Tyvek, uh, any airtight membrane can be installed properly, but 
often as not. Gary, the passive house planning package, um, it, it takes into account air tightness when it does its energy modeling, so you know how to size your mechanical system. Do you have any experience with other software packages that American uh, commercial <clears throat> engineers are using? Um, I don't know adequately if they take it into account. Do you think that they, that they need to start taking that into account to properly size their mechanical system? So the question is PHPP takes into account air leakage in designing, sizing mechanical equipment. Are there other software packages that do? And I think so. I mean, Remrate would ask for the air leakage. Uh, I think I think a lot of software packages do take air leakage into account, yeah. I don't know how they all, how good they are at running the model. I think in a lot of cases, the, the programs assume uh, that the air infiltration rate is a constant. They'll, they'll do the, this like ACH 50 divided by 20 and you get a number and then you assume that it's constant. Well, when it's 20 below zero out and there's a 40 mile an hour wind, the air infiltration is a lot higher than it is on a day when it's 60 and there's a 10 mile an hour wind. And they, if you're designing a heating system, you better design it for the design day. But at least I, I know that at least some of the software does that. I, I don't, I don't know the details though. I haven't looked into that. I have a question about yeah. that. when you should not have a negative test. Um, so that's the one scheduled. Could you get some sort of general condition, you know, where you wouldn't see above X or Y, you know, is there? Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, when should you not do a blower or a test? Uh, and I'd say uh, temperature isn't a problem. I've done blower or tests when it's 30 below zero, and I would usually only depressurize on a day like that because... <laughs> Well, of, of course, now, if it's a passive house, blowing 100 CFM of outside air into a house isn't such a big deal. Now, when I've tested houses, uh, they're usually leakier than that. And blowing 1,000 CFM of 20 below zero air into a house, that's a really cold draft, and it'll kill plants and, and birds and other small animals very quickly, I'm sure. I don't have any uh, personal experience with that, but, but I think that could be a problem. When you depressurize, though, and the, the air is coming in through lots and lots of small leaks, uh, a lot, it, it really warms up a lot, and it gets distributed around the building, and you don't notice the, the really... It, the building does not cool off nearly as fast as it does when you're pressurizing. Yeah, yeah. From an accuracy standpoint, I I think you know, once the wind gets to be more than fifteen or twenty miles an hour, it can can be a problem. Although there are things that you can do. We're, we've found that in the in the big building testing that we've done, we thought that wind was going to be a big issue, and I think that's actually one of the reasons why we we test at seventy five pascals instead of fifty, because the thought was oh the Tall buildings are going to be really noisy because of the much more exposure to the wind. Well, we thought that would be the case, so we actually measure the pressure difference between inside and outside on all four walls of the building, and then we average those uh, electronically. I mean, math, the software knows what all four pressures are, and it and it averages those four, and then we graph the average of the four. And it's amazing that that really makes uh, the wind pressure fluctuations go down a lot. Of course, if a gust of wind comes up and it hits the north side of the building, that creates a positive, uh, thinking from the outside of the building, that 
positively pressurizes the north side and at the same time it depressurizes the south side and if you average the two together a lot of the gust uh, pressures get averaged out get canceled so that helps so there are there are things like that you can do on a windy day that will allow you to get a more accurate reading there also there is a, a problem even if if you have absolutely steady wind so that you don't have these fluctuating pressures we usually think that it's the the noise the, the fluctuating pressures that that's the real big issue um, but if th there's there was a paper presented at the at a conference in Copenhagen about three weeks ago four weeks ago that I went to where they did modeling. Uh, detailed modeling of of how wind blowing on a building with certain distributions of leaks would uh, would respond to a blower dart test and and they found that that uh, it's not just the pressure fluctu well I shouldn't say they found we we knew this also. Um, because the leaks are nonlinear, because the flow through a leak is not directly, it's not linearly proportional to the pressure. Uh, when you have pressures acting across a leak before you turn the fan on, even though I said that, oh, you can subtract off the baseline and everything will be hunky-dory, it's not quite true. If, if the wind gets to be too high, you can cause errors not because of the fluctuations, but just because of the, the pressures due to the wind. I, I think 20 miles an hour, once you get above 20 miles an hour, there are probably problems. But I don't know that. I think, I think more work needs to be done on that. More work is being done on that. Hopefully, usually though, if you're, if, if you're If you're building a passive house and the goal is 0 0.6, you're typically going to be at 0 0.3, right? Sometimes, yeah. Hopefully, you learn how to how to uh, pass the standard with flying colors, so that even though there might be some errors due to the wind, you'll you'll still you'll still pass. And of course, you can always if you fail and it was windy, you can come back the next day when the wind goes down or wait until the wind dies down. But sorry, I can't give a better answer. No, that's good. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Gary. Sure. It's an excellent program. Um, I guess that'll be it for tonight. As everyone knows, we have some more beer and snacks in the back. So <laughs> feel free to, to, to finish those off. And thanks for coming. I'll stick around for a while. Chat. Thanks a lot. So you want to stop the recording? I got my.